Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and we're honored and pleased to have with us today Lawrence Summers and Robert Zellick to discuss the new Washington consensus self-declared by the Biden administration on economic policy, and particularly industrial policy, trade policy, and its linkages with foreign policy. We're privileged, as I said, to have these two distinguished former senior officials, scholars, thinkers, to discuss this with us, and obviously from somewhat differing perspectives. Lawrence Summers is the vice chair of the board of the Peterson Institute, my boss, and is also uh, Charles W. Elliott, a university professor and president emeritus at Harvard. Uh, among many other points, he was, of course, 71st Secretary of the Treasury in President Clinton's cabinet and director of the National Economic Council in President Obama's cabinet and served as vice president and chief economist of the World Bank. Robert B. Zellick is also a member of the executive committee of the board of the Peterson Institute, I'm proud to say. He served as president of the World Bank as US trade representative in President George W. Bush's cabinet and among many other roles as Deputy Secretary of State under President George Herbert Walker Bush. Um, Bob has written recently in the Wall Street Journal, uh, among other places, about issues he sees with the tale of woe, as he puts it, of the Biden administration approach. Larry has spoken out publicly on this, and the two of them together have also called for new interventions for the eventual reconstruction of Ukraine. So with that, I'd like to just say, bottom line, Bob, what do you think will be the result, foreign policy, economic policy terms of this new approach from the Biden administration? Well, first, it's a real pleasure to be here with you, Adam, and uh, and with with uh, Larry, where, as I've explained, I am often a straight man in international audiences. Um, but let me set the context of this, because it's it's natural that people often look at the individual elements. But I think uh, to understand what I call the Washington or ordered economy, so that's where the tale of woe comes from, it's important to see how the pieces fit together. But there's another point I want to draw out, which is that I, I think there's something bigger going on here, which is, in a way, a, an ideological assault on the economic beliefs that were the foundation of the Clinton-Obama administration. And I want to touch on that briefly. But to give the, the first thoughts, um, trade protection is absolutely critical for this uh, venture because you have to protect the national market against international competition as you're subsidizing things and doing various experiments. Um, so uh, it's not just tariffs, it's Buy America policies, uh, it's this in the trade area, this complex area of rule of origin. Um, but you'll see how that's critical throughout. Then second, you have these very large uh, subsidies for preferred industrial sectors. Uh, Chad Bowen at the Peterson Institute has already demonstrated how the combination of the Trump and Biden policies for electric vehicles took the United States from being the leader of the exports to actually making China the leader of electric vehicle exports and indeed of all so auto exports. Um, one can also, I, I think, and I think it should be done to disaggregate what we're really trying to do in the semiconductor space. Um, and then, but take a basic issue like uh, solar power. If you want to encourage solar power, why would you put tariffs and or taxes on the inputs, so which sort of makes it more expensive. Third, um, the antitrust policy is actually a reversal of 40 years of bipartisan approach that established the key economic principle of focus on prices mm -hmm. and uh, I would say consumer interests, the economists would say consumer welfare. Um, and uh, the policy now is unmoored other than bigness is bad when the government decides that bigness is bad. And I think that has also some political implications. Then we've got the broader economic regulatory environment, which of course is always part of policy, but I think you're starting to see an accumulation of costs pushing towards preferred business models if, if necessary, actually sort of banning uh, certain types of activities. And particularly when the SEC gets involved, many people aren't 
as familiar with this, but you start to get the risks of litigation. And in a, in a world of trial lawyers in, in the US, that becomes quite significant. Um, then fifth, another one that hasn't gotten as much attention is investment reviews. So this is the CFIUS process, the uh, foreign investment uh, review process. Treasury, as Larry knows, has always chaired that process. And traditionally, because Treasury is the chair, it, it put the, the focus on how to maintain open investment while taking care of national security. You now have a whole new bureaucracy where, chair, where, where Treasury is basically a coordinator where you've got the Justice Department, you've got the Pentagon, you've got the Department of Homeland Security, all with what I call Pentagon-style economics, trying to, uh, in a sense, guide and restrict uh, the foreign investment. And six, you have the whole issue of spending a lot of money, whether or debt forgiveness, as we saw with student loans, where you're trying to buy interest groups or trying to overcome some of the economic problems. One last thought about this, I think people ought to pay close attention to, when you have this amount of money and in government intervention, you do have to worry about whether how much of it is special interest politics, whether it starts to, in a sense, corrupt the capitalist model, focus CEOs more on how they're going to get their big loans and packages from the government. And I think that has a long-term effect. Now, one, one last area, and that is this challenge of the kind of what the Sullivan speech and what I'll call the, the cell of thinkers uh, among the sort of the, the, uh, the new economic thinking of the administration represents versus the Democratic Party's economic thinkers of the Clinton-Obama years. And as someone who worked in Republican administrations, I have to say, beware. This already happened on the Republican side, and the wrong guys won. So don't let it happen to you, OK? So let me just emphasize the following. One, if I look back at the Clinton-Obama years, there was a focus on uh, fiscal uh, integrity and management. And so Obviously, these are Keynesians, but at the same time, there's an idea of some degree of fiscal discipline. The new version is the modern monetary theory. So spend whatever you want, have the central bank funded, be less concerned about inflation and monetary policy. Second example is in the Clinton-Obama years, there was a focus closely on price effects. And so you, you may work with the market, but you're very concerned about sort of price signals. Notice with the new crew, it's, well, we don't care about efficiency. We don't care about costs, whether it's antitrust or trade, we don't, really don't sort of care about prices. That's a fundamentally different approach. A third point would be, I think the Clinton-Obama years believed that the private sector had to be the leading engine of the economy, but of course, with redistribution policies, which was part of the, the center left. The new view is the state is the guy. The state will direct, whether with regulatory policy, subsidies, or others. And then the last piece is that the Clinton-Obama years clearly had an internationalist orientation. You had to figure out, well, if you had domestic policies, how would this affect interest rates, debt, trade policies? How do you encourage the rest of the world to grow? How does this help build partnerships? And this view is, frankly, the, the, the current view is one where internationally we'll have happy talk, but the, the logic is basically, we don't want those people interfering with the domestic economy. It's a, it's, it's a national economy model for those students of economic history. It's got some similarities with sort of the first New Deal approach where you try to constrict the international um, sort of uh, influence on your domestic environment. And if you want to go back a little bit more in, in economic history, it's not so new. This is Friedrich List versus sort of what I'll call Adam Smith moder uh, sort of moderated by sort of Keynesian policies. No, it's it's quite the view, Bob. And as you say, you served in Republican administrations and you saw the economic nationalists take over. And at the Peterson Institute, we're kind of scared of that. But Larry, how do you see the Sullivanomics as well as Bob's characterization of the Clinton-Obama worldview, which you had something to do with? It's uh, good to be here with Peterson, Adam, and it's uh, particularly uh, good to have yet another opportunity to learn from uh, all of Bob's uh, experience. Look, I think one should distinguish what the administration has mostly done, a large part of which I agree with, from the administration's doctrine which I think is increasingly dangerous. I supported the IRA 
because not in every uh, detail, because I thought it was overwhelmingly important that the United States have a strong, aggressive climate uh, strategy. And I thought that's what the IRA represented. I think and thought that there are serious issues around uh, semiconductors and that a investment, even an investment of $60 billion was, had sufficient prospect of improving our situation to make it a worthwhile uh, investment. So I believe that those two signature items of Biden policy uh, were appropriate steps. That said, I am profoundly concerned by the doctrine of manufacturing centers economic nationalism that is increasingly being put forth as a general principle uh, to guide policy. I think it's important to begin with a recognition of our current situation. We do not have a problem of a shortfall of jobs. Indeed, the number of open jobs relative to any interesting denominator is greater than it has been any time since we began collecting the statistics. We do have a problem of uh, costs. If you just put up the one slide I have uh, here, Adam, I'd be grateful. Jessica, please share slide. Thank you. This slide, which was prepared by uh, Jason Furman, and you can do the thing in a large number of ways and you get about the same conclusion, shows that the challenge we have as a consequence of all the things that have happened is that uh, real wages are people's standard of living, what they're able to buy within hours of work an hour of work are not where we would like them to be. They're substantially below what one would have expected from a trend before the Biden administration uh, came into uh, power. It is right to be concerned about the environment. It is right to be concerned about resilience. It is wrong to suppose that manufacturing-based economic nationalism is a route to higher incomes or better standards of living for the middle class. Real wages represent wages divided by prices, and you make them go down if the wage is too low, or if the prices are too high. That is why inflationary policies are problematic. That is why measures which raise any set of uh, prices are problematic unless otherwise uh, justified. That is why I'm so concerned by the administration's attitude or non-attitude towards trade. What is never said about the U.S. trade agreements of the last 50 years is that in virtually every case, they were not just good free trade policy, but they were good mercantilism. Any changes that took place in American trade barriers were small compared to the trade barriers that took place, reductions in trade barriers that took place with respect to other countries. Take China's much maligned accession into the WTO. The United States had already established the principle on more than a dozen occasions that China received MFN. That meant that every benefit that the United States extended to more than 100 other countries in the WTO were extended to China before China joined the WTO. 
The only consequence of China joining the WTO was a variety of new kinds of disciplines imposed on China for the benefit of American uh, producers and for the benefit of American consumers. Similarly, the tariff reductions that took place and market access reductions that took place in the United States in the context of NAFTA were a very small fraction of those that took place in the context, uh, in the context of what took place uh, in uh, Mexico. So these agreements reduced prices and steps in the opposite uh, direction towards higher tariffs, towards the maintenance of higher tariffs, raise prices and reduce real incomes. Equally, in calculations that are never done when these job losses are considered, they raise uh, the costs for potential U.S. importers. Take, for example, U.S. Uh, steel uh, protect protection. The number of workers in the U.S. steel industry is about 1% of the number of workers in U.S. steel using industries. All of those industries suffer when steel prices are increased as a consequence of protection. Adam, you, you did work at the Peterson Institute that estimated that we would have had 2% lower cumulative inflation to this point without the protectionist policies that have been imposed on uh, China. That would have been a meaningful consequence uh, for U.S. inflation and also enabled lower U.S. interest rates and for the benefit of uh, families uh, purchasing homes. Thank you. Larry. Another example is the FTC's uh, and uh, Justice Department's recent merger uh, guidelines, which discard as the animating principle of antitrust the idea of lower consumer costs and greater consumer welfare. Yes, we should enforce the antitrust law more than we have over the last 30 years, but we should do that in service of a doctrine of higher incomes through lower costs uh, for consumers. And finally, I would just question the overwhelming emphasis that is placed in administration rhetoric on the buying of American manufactured goods. The share of American workers engaged in production work in manufacturing is now below 5%. It is about a quarter of what it was in uh, 1960. In every country, including the legendary manufacturing powerhouses like Germany and China, manufacturing production work as a share of the workforce has declined very substantially. This is driven by fundamental technological forces, just like what happened with uh, agriculture. It is not plausible to suppose that that is going to be reversed at any reasonable cost in any reasonable horizon. And so the framing of the objective in those terms is, it seems to me, profoundly uh, misguided. So yes, let us respond to new challenges from the environment. Let us respond to new challenges with respect to resilience in appropriate and targeted ways. But Adam, the best generals are the ones who hate war the most, but know that it occasionally must be fought. And the best industrial policy advocates are those who recognize 
just how problematic these interventions are and believe that they should be kept to a necessary minimum to achieve non-economic objectives, not who fall victim to the meaty Peron fallacy that industrial policy is some kind of some kind of route to prosperity for the middle class. Thank you, Larry. Um, just to say, for those of you interested in more, we have a number of charts on the PIE website from work I've done, others have done. We have a forthcoming book from Robert Lawrence on these declines in manufacturing employment globally and putting them into this context. Bob, Larry and you have obviously overlapped on some of these things. Let me turn to you though with more of your foreign policy hat on. So amidst the economic arguments that both you and Larry addressed, there is as part of the Biden administration Sullivan doctrine that it's okay to spend all this money because of the national security threat, because of China. And just could you say a little more about whether you think that's the get out of jail free card that justifies manufacturing obsession or are there other ways of dealing with the national security issues vis-a-vis -vis China? Well, a, a couple of thoughts, Adam. One, um, the competition to subsidize, which the United States has launched, will of course be followed in the European Union in Japan by other efforts to subsidize. Yeah. Taxpayers beware, people who worried about budget and debt, the Peterson, part of the Peterson Institute, uh, take note, okay? At some point, you actually have to add up these numbers and somebody has to pay for this. Okay? But if you're in the, what's now referred to as the global South, the developing world, this is very scary because yeah. you don't have the ability to be able to subsidize to the same degree. So if you're actually concerned about the developing world, one should scrutinize what the effects of these policies will be. Then there's a knockoff effect, which is when you subsidize industries, as you've seen in the case of the Biden administration, you say, well, two things. One, we don't want foreigners to get the benefit of this. So we'll have sort of buy America provisions. So it's only the purchasers right. are done in the US, developing countries left out, allies and other partners uh, left out. But then similarly, um, you you have to protect these, these systems. So the the electric vehicle example that, that Chad Bowen is just a really rich one. I mean, this one starts with Trump. The, U, the U.S. raises tariffs on China, so China raises tariffs back, including on autos. Now, China actually lowered its auto tariffs for the rest of the world. So the leading electric vehicle producer, Tesla, in the United States says, well, let's move to China. And they not only move to China, but they create a whole economic system for electric vehicle production that leads China to now be the world leader. The Biden administration says, oh, well, we then have to challenge this idea. We, of course, we won't change any of the tariff structure, but so we'll subsidize. But the subsidies block out the Europeans. Right. And so the Europeans say, well, if you're going to play this game, we'll have retaliation. So the administration says, oh, 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 let's change the rules. So they find a part of the statute that says we can let in the European electric vehicles if they're leased products. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, that provision doesn't have some of the restrictions that the US provision has in right. terms of dollar amounts and others. So the European leased electric vehicles actually get a better deal than the US subsidized portion. And at least Chad's most recent numbers show the European electric vehicles are coming in. Now that's not bad if you wanna encourage electric vehicles, but notice what's happened by the combination of the protectionism, the buy America, the subsidies is that We've made China sort of the most advanced player in electric vehicles. We've angered the Europeans, and we'll see what happens in electric vehicle production in the United States, at least according to the news stories. A lot of them are not being very successful, except the original one, Tesla. Okay, so where are we on this process? And so part of the challenge of industrial policy, and, and Larry's seen this, is that his point about sort of the generals, it, it, it there can be appealing concepts about it. But it's devilishly difficult. And, you know, sometimes you might want to go back to the experience about sort of what's happened or what's not happened before. And, and this goes back to the broader question you say about international posture. Uh, 
and you, you mentioned China in particular, I think it would be a huge mistake for the United States to, to sort of imitate Chinese policies in competing with China. If you look at the whole source of Chinese growth from the Deng Xiaoping era, it was trying by opening up to the world economy. As Larry said, they actually lowered a lot of the barriers. Now, since Xi Jinping came in in 2012, they've had much more focus on the Communist Party, on the state, on control. I don't think it's working so well. So why should we imitate what isn't working well? We ought to try to go with our strengths in the process. Now, and the last part of this in the connectivity is the more we withdraw and just focus on our subsidies, uh, our barriers, our Buy America provisions, we're not in the game abroad to shape the standards of the future. So one of the strengths of U.S. trade policy in the past, motivated by self-interest, is our economy was at the cutting edge. Services, intellectual property, transparency, anti-corruption, environmental labor standards. Those are all core part of the agreements that we promoted. And so we're now not at the table. I mean, so Catherine Tai, the U.S. trade representative, said mm, trade policy focused too much on liberalization and costs and efficiency. She would like them to change their environmental and labor policies, but it's a little hard if you also don't have part of the package that would suggest how they can have win-win benefits. So on the security point, the biggest problem, just after having attended a security conference, is the policies the Biden administration has to strengthen allies, relations with the Quad, all good, good steps. But in the economic competition in East Asia, we're not in the game. And presumably over the long term, economic competition with China is going to be as important as having the military posture. Thanks, Bob. I mean, just to continue to give our audience references if they'd like to pursue more, Doug Irwin, Marcus Noland have written important work looking at the history of industrial policy in Korea, Japan, and elsewhere, and also Robert Lawrence. And of course, Nicholas Lardy did books, Markets Over Mao, on how the private sector led the Chinese growth and the state strikes back about Xi's shift. And we have more recent work on that by Tian Lei. And Adam Posen has done some good articles on this topic. Thank you, Bob, as have I. I appreciate that. Um, but just to say that, um, Larry, so you, you touched on this a bit in your opening remarks, but on the macroeconomic side, on the issues of capital flows and development, of debt, of relations with the developing world, how do you see this subsidies war, this approach playing out? I mean, you've obviously worked on the vaccines issue and other issues having to do with development, just as Bob did when leading the World Bank. Does this, should this matter to the Biden administration? Is this a problem? Adam, I'd, I'd say a couple of things and I'll come to what you said. The first is most progressives think it's terrible that there's ruinous competition between the states to give tax breaks in an effort to get Amazon to locate in Northern Virginia rather than New York and the like. I can't understand why if they hate that, they're extremely proud of having set off such competition between the United States and Europe with respect to the manufacturing of various kinds of green technology. I thought it was the purpose of progressives to stop these kinds of subsidy wars rather than uh, to set them off. Second thing I would say is that I do take seriously the national security objectives and I don't have access to the classified information that would permit me to evaluate those arguments uh, rigorously. But whenever somebody explains how a terrific thing about their industrial policy is not how it's gonna make us secure, but how many jobs it's going to create in a politically sensitive state, or how there's gonna be strong union representation at uh, the production activity of the industrial policy, or how a condition for getting access to the money is going to be having a highly credible childcare program. I wonder about whether the objective is actually focused on the genuine national security objective. And the third thing I would say is that I think there is a difference between industrial 
strategy understood broadly. God knows, I like to think that if I'd been around, I would have been for the Trans-Pacific Railroad, that I would have been for the land-grant uh, colleges, that I would have been for the interstate highway system, that I would have been for the space program, that I would have been for the NIH. There is a big difference between a developmental state that broadly seeks to undergird a powerful market uh, economy with investments at home and global frameworks abroad. That is the right broad developmental strategy. That's what's involved also in the creation of institutions uh, like the World Bank. That is a very different uh, thing than what's being called industrial policy uh, today, which is this patchwork of subsidies nationalistically oriented uh, towards uh, manufacturing. I would like to see the United States much more engaged in the promotion of the global flow of uh, capital throughout the world. I think that the biggest struggle we face today, as in many ways, the biggest struggle we faced uh, during the Cold War is for hearts and minds throughout the world beyond the traditionally uh, rich uh, world. And I think what is so problematic about the direction of our policy is how little emphasis there is on that and how much emphasis there is on the nationalist uh, elements. Uh, Bob and I have uh, joined with Phil Zellico to push one idea, uh, which is that uh, Russian reserves should be uh, deployed to compensate uh, those who have uh, lost out because of Russian naked aggression, most obviously and prominently and on the largest scale in Ukraine, but also uh, beyond Ukraine. That idea has many virtues, but one important one is that it prevents what I think is a very real risk that as we do what is necessary for uh, Ukraine and its victims, that we will cut short support to Africa at a desperately uh, important moment, cut short investments in pandemic prevention, which are already being uh, scaled back, and underinvest in what is actually the key front in the war on climate uh, change, which is what's going on in the developing uh, world. And I'd like to see massive investment in those things be a signature part of Bidenomics as well. Why shouldn't the Biden administration have some adjusted to this moment global mission success analogous to what the PEPFAR program was to the administration of President George W. Bush, H. George W. Bush. Yeah. Um, Bob, I want to come to you, obviously, former president of the World Bank and co-author with Larry and Phil Zellico on this. Just a reminder to our audience, res registered audience members can submit questions over the Q&A tool, which we'll collect and post to our guests later today. Adam, can I, uh, since yeah. uh, I, I'm, I'm shocked, given the fact that I'm with two top grade economists, that when you asked about the macroeconomic effects, that President Summers um, sort of whiffed the ball on it. So let me, I, as I think, a, I think he took a called strike. So, so, so let me sort of point out, and this is important, I'm trying to, again, defend the Clinton Obama era, when you talk to the the new theorists, okay, they they say, well, of course costs are important, of course price are important, but 
really, you know, can't we just be a little soft on this? Can't we sort of give a little bit sort of more room on it? And I thought that you guys had the belief that economics was fundamentally a discipline at the margin and prices matter. Okay. So I would have thought even politically, the Biden administration would have recognized inflation is not a winner. Right. Um, There's a story over the past week about, well, after we have various types of tariffs on steel, should we have tariffs on so the, the tin type of steel that's used for cans? And oh, by the way, this is the food that people at low and moderate income right. sort of eat, so a little increase their prices. So the, the, the marginal price effect on inflation and its macroeconomic issue is the thing that I thought that sort of, dare I say it, neoliberal Democrats actually paid attention to, and these guys aren't, and it's going to be a big cost for them as you would try to try to see. I think so, and let me just bridge for a second before going giving Larry another pitch. Um, I think that the price effects you've talked about are very important. Larry mentioned a study done by Gary Huffbauer, Meg Hogan, and Yilin Wang here at the Institute, but I think not just prices, quantities. So as Jason Furman has said, and I know Larry, and I believe you agree, Bob, you know, part of the problem with the Biden fiscal policies of 2021 and it's causing inflation wasn't what they did. It was that they threw all the logs in the fire at the same time. So the quantity matters. Larry gave us talk at the Institute about a month ago, which I happen to agree with, um, that the medium term outlook for the U.S., if you spend on defense, if you spend on green investment, if you spend on demographics of an aging society, is for more spending. And then if you throw on top of it this kind of subsidies game, it gets really big numbers. So quantities as well as prices. But, but Larry, do you want to take another whiff at the uh, macro side? Well, I hope it will be a swing, not a whiff. Um, Adam, uh, that's I suppose for uh, others to uh, others to judge. I, I don't think my concerns about inflation have been particularly well hidden over the last several years, so I didn't feel a need to rehearse them uh, yet again. But going I just, forward, I would just say I would just say uh, say this. Uh, I was pretty close to the situation when the Clinton administration um, came in in 1993 and decided that we had a critical fiscal problem. I was pretty close to the situation in uh, 19, uh, in 2010 and 2011, when the nation set off the Simpson Bowles uh, process out of concern about long run deficits. And I would judge our current uh, fiscal problems to be two to three times as serious on a go forward basis as on either of uh, those occasions. I say that because the initial level of debt is far higher than three times as high as it was in uh, 1993 and very substantially higher than in 2010. And because the prospective deficits properly calculated are uh, very high for reasons people can hear on the Peterson uh, talk that you referred to, Adam, uh, my belief is that if you make reasonable assumptions, and I don't think it's a reasonable assumption that uh, the T-bill rate will average 2.3% over the next 10 years. If you make what seem to me to be conservative, reasonable assumptions, prospective deficits um, in the beginning of the 2030s, at the end of the 10-year window, are above 10% of GDP, and rising. And you can make all the arguments about RNG and primary deficit and all of that that you want. And I probably have more sympathy with some of those arguments than uh, Bob does. But we are out of the range of arguments about the potentially justifiable in terms of uh, projected uh, deficits. And 
the more one takes seriously the range of international threats that we face, the more important uh, it is. I mean, I think it is interesting to ask the question when we talk about resilience, why isn't our national degree of leverage and debt considered one aspect of assessing our national resilience? Why isn't our preparedness to raise taxes in the face of emergency one aspect of our national resilience when our political process on a bipartisan basis has taken taxing 99% um, of the population uh, off uh, the table. It seems to me that a serious approach to resilience would involve setting the government up to respond flexibly to a range of threats that surely loom and emergencies that surely could loom ahead in the future. And I think that would be a much greater contribution, frankly, to, uh, Nash, to uh, resilience than investments in uh, certain job creating uh, projects at a moment when unemployment is almost unprecedentedly low. Thank you, Larry. I'll, I'll score that as more than a hit. Um, Bob, can I bring you back, before we turn to audience questions, can I bring you back to the argument you and Larry and Zelikow have made about Ukraine reconstruction and the funds? That's to many, to two aspects of that. First is, as Larry summarized it, that doesn't sound all that neoliberal. You're, you're, you're taking assets in a way that previous governments have not. Why are you comfortable with that? Is this a good precedent going forward? And second, you set it up somewhat as this will keep us from cutting development aid and other important priorities, but obviously there's still need for money for that. How, are, do you worry if you do this, you're not gonna be able to raise money for something else or how do you get more money for the World Bank, the IMF, the MDBs? So Larry alluded to this. I actually think th this is something we'll see evolve over the next couple of months. I think this actually can combine with some help for developing countries. But but let me set the context. Um, Ukraine and Russia are engaged in a war of attrition. And the, the daily newspapers are full of, well, should we have F-16? Should we have uh, tanks? Should we have sort of uh, actums, different artillery shells? That's all very important. But it's kind of like uh, the kids soccer game where they all move towards the ball of right. the battlefield. Okay. In a war of attrition, economics is equally, if not more important in terms of being able not only to survive, but to deal with the societal uh, aspects of this. And so I think what Larry and Phil and I are trying to do is to try to recognize you need an economic strategy as well as a military strategy over the long-term campaign. And I would say even more now, because I think if you if you think about the struggles of the offensive and the ongoing bombardment of Ukraine, we're going into a winter of discontent here. And so the question for Putin, by the way, people say, oh, Putin's been defeated. Well, to me, this is a contest of wills. He's certainly going to run through the next 2024 election to see what happens in the United States. And so in a contest of wills, economics is, is a very important part. You have to separate out the different needs. So Ukraine needs about $3 billion a month for basically just to keep the lights on. OK, so this is not recovery. This is not reconstruction. This is to avoid sort of hyper uh, in, inflation. Uh, and the U.S. and Europe have provided that money. It, is, it took a while, but they've now done it. One question will be, how much will the U.S. Congress in the autumn be willing to provide that as well as the military? aid? Frankly, I think the idea we've talked about, and I've discussed this with some uh, members of Congress and their staffs, I think if we can tap Russian reserves, it'll actually help get some of the votes for the military supplies, because I don't think otherwise the environment is appropriate for that. Another part that uh, a group called the, the out of Europe did this Center for European Policy Reform. In addition to long-term reconstruction, we need to consider what I'll call fast recovery. 
So you've had about 13 million people displaced, either within Ukraine or outside. If you're going to have a functioning economy or not lose your human capital, you need to have um, shelter, schools, sort of medical facilities in parts of the country, because you can't wait for the war to end in this process. And all this requires money. Now, there is, without getting too legally wonky about this, there is a legal basis that's established under international law called countermeasures mm -hmm. that we've we've talked about, and and we're can, Bill Zelico will continue to sort of write about this basis, and so both both uh, Larry and I have said this is a classic case of where you have a possibility that is strategically wise, good policy. Uh, frankly, ethically sound and good politics. How many of those do you get in government, right? And so I personally think you're going to see the Congress move the domestic legislative authority, which probably already exists, but they're trying to push the administration this fall. And this will help sort of move the item sort of along further along. Another point, as Larry emphasized, if you're talking about two or three hundred billion dollars, you're not going to use all that money right away. I mean, and so you put it in an escrow, which adds a diplomatic variable, whether to help with the settlement. And the idea that we've talked about with the IMF and others is there were other parties that were hurt by these food and energy prices. If we can have a principal basis to create some claims process for that, this is what was done after the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait. Right. There were over 40 different claims requ requested. It wasn't just going to Kuwait. So you have a principal basis of that. That can help meet some of the needs of the developing countries that you were sort of talking about and help avoid this division of, well, why are you fighting over Ukraine, but not Ethiopia and others? By the way, a point that both you and Larry have made, this is where resilience in an open economy is important to have sort of the adaptability of your trading system. Right. Ethiopia got hammered in terms of grain from uh, Ukraine, Egypt. but it, but it, but also I think, uh, Ethiopia, and, but they quickly moved to get Argentinian supplies. Yeah. So it's often overlooked that an open, resilient, adaptable system, and this is what Marcus uh, uh, Brockenmeyer sort of wrote about is sort of critically important. Then the last question that for, for this community is particularly is, okay, but does this somehow violate the notion of the reserves and the dollar? Okay, and here, I guess, number one response. For, for First off, most of the money's held actually in euro, but it's very important to try to do this together with the euro, the yen, the dollar, the pound, and that is the inclination. In fact, I understand the Japanese have been even sort of moving um, in this direction. Second, however, bankers have to take into account the real life reality of if you're not going to hold one of those currencies, what are you going to hold? Crypto? Gold? There'll be some gold increases, but you've got obviously challenges with that. You want to hold your capital in RMB? You go ahead and do that. Right. Okay. And so um, one of the issues here, and we've seen this over the question about the use of the dollar over time, is that, you know, the reason that people hold dollars is not because they want to be friendly to America. It's because of the liquidity, the depth, and the, uh, uh, the sureness about U.S. capital markets. I'll go one step. For, and by the way, the point that you and Larry talked about, if you want to be concerned about the value of the dollar, well, maybe we ought to be a little concerned about deficit and debt and interest right. rates in the future. That's more important than this is. But I'll go one step further, and this is where the security hits the economics. Look, where is it written that you can hold dollars and then you want to invade and brutalize your neighboring country? You know, I, it doesn't bother me that you don't get to hold dollars. It's our currency. I think most countries hold dollars for macroeconomic purposes, right. not so they can invade their neighbors. And so I think this is an important development in international law that sends a signal to countries, you can't do this. And so then people say, oh, what about the Chinese case? And there's, you'll be aware of this too, is that look, the Chinese wouldn't hold dollars if they could avoid doing it. But we have something called the current account deficit. They are uh, buying, uh, we're buying more from them than the reverse, they get dollars. And frankly, if they decide they don't want to hold dollars, what happens to the exchange rate? What happens to their economy? So this is a strength that has been developed over the U.S. economy over 200 years. We have to be prudent with it. Fine. Let's focus on debt and deficits. But let's not assume that the dollar is a freebie for everybody else to use while they brutalize their neighbors. Look, um, Bob's sophisticated. I'm simple-minded. This is... <laughs> part of something that's been going on for a long time. We used to have bearer bonds. 
where you could collect interest and it was all anonymous and it was tax free. And people said that was wrong and we should abolish them. And people said it would destroy the credit of the United States. And we got rid of bearer bonds and a bunch of crime got avoided. We got rid of the $10,000 bill. It got harder to be an organized uh, criminal and the dollar did fine. And so if we make the dollar no longer a reserve asset for naked aggressors, I actually think that's a better world, not a worse world. And we should absolutely never do this alone without the Europeans and the Japanese. But as long as we're doing it with the Europeans and the Japanese, um, I think it's really as easy a choice as there is. And look, people, Bob said something very important. Bob and I are usually for the right thing, which often puts us against the expedient thing. This is the rare case where the expedient thing, Russian, the Russian central bank pays rather than U.S. taxpayers. That's got to be an ultimately expedient thing. And this is a case where the expedient thing is the right thing. And I'm frankly surprised that the political pressure for this from all the publics that are otherwise going to be paying large fortunes has not been uh, louder than it has been to date. And I suspect it will come. Just one last point on this. A, a question you should ask yourself is, how likely is it that the American Congress and public will agree to give this money back to the Russians? And if that's not very likely, let's try to use it in a constructive way to help Ukraine and perhaps help a settlement of the war. Okay, I'm sold. Let me <laughs> turn now to a couple of good questions from our audience. So um, Matt Peterson from Barron's and Daniel Flatterly, Flatley of Bloomberg both have a question about some of the investment review issues, Bob, that you did in your tale of woe. Um, how do you see this playing out, both the proposals for outbound investment reviews, will that affect other countries than China, the inbound investment reviews, as you said, CFIUS seems to be behaving very differently now. Could you expand a bit more on that? So uh, I've learned through Larry's model that the power of anecdote is sometimes even better than analysis. And so I used to be on CFIUS. And I remember uh, a case we had to deal with that had a security concern in the Pentagon and the Department of Homeland Security were in on it. And I said, well, look, can we still support open investment, but come up with some sort of protective board or sort of mechanism to do this? And that's what we did. I was the simple old USTR with 250 people versus these thousands. And John Snow, at that time, the Secretary of the Treasury, invites me to lunch and says, you know, Bob, thanks for doing that. You know, I'm the chair, so I thought I should sort of just be, you know, mod not take a position on this. And I said, John, the reason why secretaries of the Treasury have insisted on chairing CFIUS for decades is not to be even handed. You're supposed to support open investment. The relevance of that to today is the Treasury has now bureaucratized this. Okay. And so I, without getting into some of the particulars, as opposed to Treasury leaning to say it should be open unless you can make a strong case. It's throw all this, the, the vegetables in the pot. Let's start to sort of stir it up. And then, of course, what happens in government bureaucracies is, well, let's add this limitation. Let's add this reporting requirement. This, of course, for anybody in the investment world, adds time. It adds uncertainty. It adds various types of restrictions. We'll pay a price for this. Now, they asked about the, uh, ex and of course, other countries will do this and it'll affect our investment. And by the way, as the Peterson Institute has pointed out, you know, when we do foreign investment abroad, that's often one of the biggest drivers yes. in terms of our trade and exports. Frankly, it's been proven that it's also one of the biggest aspects for development right. in these countries and technical and knowledge. So think about the second order effects. On the, on the external uh, sort of investment limitations, the administration has said, well, we're going to make them very narrow. We're going to make them very limited, so on and so forth. 
And I suspect that at the start, that's what they will look like, okay? But remember, Cepheus was created, I think, in 74, 76, and it wasn't supposed to be doing any of the things that it's now doing, okay? So these things have a way of expanding, okay? And all of a sudden, Congress starts to come in and say, well, why should we be investing in this, this, and this? And to give you one to take the semiconductor case now that I don't, I haven't heard a satisfactory answer is, okay, we're subsidizing all these firms. Will they be able to continue to sell into China? This is what the CEO of, of Intel just sort of raised uh, last week in Intel. For many of them, it's 20 to 25% of their revenues. But how would the politics sound when, sound when Congress says, I'm giving you billions of dollars to subsidize you. In effect, I'm subsidizing your products. And you're giving that to the Chinese? And so, and then unfortunately, there's even some companies like NVIDIA that aren't getting the right. subsidies, but they're going to get caught into this. So it's a good example of when you start to come in with the idea, well, should we support semiconductor uh, uh, industries in the United States? You have to ask yourself, okay, uh, are we going to, do we want them to export? Do we want them not to export? Um, by the way, could we get some of this from the subsidized production in Japan and Germany and Korea as opposed to doing it at home? And this critical question, which always revolves around this, is that, you know, what's the business model? So we want high-end chips, do we want low-end chips? And and in any investment, whether you make it public or private, you have to have some sense of what's the performance standards. It's, is it the number that they produce? Is it the quality? Is it the jobs, as Larry mentioned? You know, is it revenue or profits? Is it the unionization goals? We haven't addressed these questions. So uh, key to the theme that you had here and that Larry and I have talked about is, look, I'm not against a government you know, investment for public goods, for R&D. I like the R&D part of it. You start to get into particular sectors and industries and companies, and you better answer these questions. No, that's great, Bob. But just another reference for our uh, viewers. It's one second, but Larry, another reference for our viewers, current work on this at the Peterson Institute is being done by Martin Chorzempa, Mary Lovely, as well as past work done by Gary Huffbauer, Theodore Moran, Brad Jensen, and others. Larry. I was just going to say, Here's what haunts me a bit. The Jones Act, everybody agrees, raises the price of oil for people who want to heat their homes in uh, New England. And it's not families like mine that are bearing the principal burden of that substantially complicated our relief efforts for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands after uh, their storms causes us to import more oil from abroad rather than from Texas than we otherwise would. The Jones Act was the cutting edge resilience policy of the 1920s. There was a really compelling logic that it was a moment when things were all transported by ships and the United States needed to have its own shipping uh, capacity. And yet over a hundred years, much more harm than good has been done. That example is not isolated. If one didn't have economic nationalist policies, we wouldn't have had an infant formula crisis in uh, the United States. Americans spend more to travel across the country because somebody decided that having a resilient economy required that British Airways be unable to pick up a passenger in Boston and take them to uh, Los Angeles. And so I think we need to be very mindful of the fact that once put in place, these policies endure for a very long time and often morph into having perverse consequences unimaginable at the time they were put in place, and be extremely careful and cautious at their moment of uh, implementation. And that's why I find this new enthusiasm uh, for these kinds of policies uh, to be such a problematic turn uh, in direction. Of course, extraordinary problems require extraordinary measures, but it's the enthusiasm for the intervention 
that I think is deeply problematic. Thank you, Larry. And so as economics research has shown time and again, not just at the Peterson Institute, picking up on Larry's last point, we see subsidies escalate even faster than tariffs, mm -hmm. and we see subsidies persist and restrictions persist even longer than tariffs. Uh, so this may not be a one-way road, but it is a road that the momentum goes one way once you're on it. I'd like to thank both Bob Zellick, Larry Summers, a uh, member of the executive committee of the Peterson Board, vice chair of the Peterson Board of Directors, and states people, longtime global public servants, for helping us address today the issue of state intervention and industrial policies in today's global context. And Adam, can I thank you and the Peterson Institute staff who are doing the best work on these full range of topics. So you'll see a lot of the examples I draw from come from reading the papers down here. That's fabulous, Bob. Thank you. And tell us what papers to write, please. With that, everyone, hope to see you soon at another Peterson event.